coming up, find out which royal celebrities are visiting Boston this week. And unprecedented protests continue in China due to strict COVID policies. All that and much more today, Thursday, December 1st. Good morning, Emerson. I'm Drew Mitchell. And I'm Caroline Reese. Happy December! Unfortunately, our hosts aren't able to make it today, but we are so glad to be waking up with you all this morning. Now let's jump right into our top stories. We have some exciting visits coming up in Boston. After spending his Thanksgiving in Nantucket, President Biden is coming here this weekend. He'll be appearing at a fundraiser to help raise money for Democrats in Georgia's Senate runoff election. Boston Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey are expected to join Biden at this event. And we also have a visit from royalty. Prince William and Princess Kate arrived in Boston yesterday afternoon. The two are spending the weekend in Massachusetts for the 2022 Earthshot Prize Award ceremony. The Earthshot Prize, which was founded by Prince William, is a ceremony and collection of awards. They honor efforts and solutions made to create a more sustainable planet. The awards will take place at MGM Music Hall tomorrow night. You can also expect to see some famous names, including headlining performer Billie Eilish. Prince William told the press that they are, quote, delighted to be back in the United States. They expressed gratitude toward Governor Baker and the First Lady of Massachusetts. You know, there are so many people there to see them last night, standing in that rain. Oh, yeah, and I was running right past them <laughs> trying to get out of that atrocious weather. So many. And that, that is the first time they're here since the Queen passed away. Yeah, well, we're excited to have them back. We are so excited. Now, let's go to our political correspondent, Molly Doherty, who tells us about some of the progress that has been made in the Senate. Molly? Thank you, Caroline. The Senate has voted to protect same-sex and interracial marriage. The Respect for Marriage Act passed Tuesday with a 61 to 36 vote. All of the Senate Democrats and 12 Republicans voted yes. While both same-sex and interracial marriage is legal in the U.S., neither are currently protected by federal law. Even if states ban same-sex marriages, the bill requires the states and the federal government to respect marriages conducted in states where it's legal. LGBTQ plus activists wanted federal legislation to protect marriage equality after the Supreme Court's threat of overturn in June. The legislation will now go to the House for approval before making its way to President Biden's desk to be signed into law. And yesterday, the House passed a bipartisan bill to prevent a rail strike. The legislation forces unions to accept the compromise labor agreement reached in September. Four of the 12 unions involved in the negotiations voted down the agreement. President Biden asked congressional leaders Monday to intervene to prevent harm to the economy during the holiday season. Some lawmakers and union members alike want additional benefits added to the legislation, including more paid leave. The House also passed a separate measure to add a week of paid sick leave to the agreement. The legislation now goes to the Senate for approval. And in more international news, protests are still going on in China over COVID restrictions. Individuals are protesting against China's zero COVID lockdown policies. Unlike other countries working to control the virus, China seeks to keep the number of COVID-19 cases close to zero. This spring, the Shanghai government forced millions into lockdown for two months, leaving many without food. Individuals who test positive for the virus in mandated testing are sent to government quarantine centers, which have been criticized for poor conditions. Protesters are calling for an end to the restrictive policies and the resignation of Chinese President Jinping. That's all I have for politics today. Back to you two at the desk. Thank you so much, Molly. The controversy of Twitter under new owner Elon Musk continues to develop each day. The newest development is that social media giant will no longer enforce its COVID-19 misinformation policy, which has been in place since 2020. The policy was launched to prevent the spread of what the company called harmful misinformation relating to the pandemic. 
Musk did not make a formal announcement regarding the decision. Instead, users discovered a note added to the Twitter website announcing the termination of the policy. Musk has been made a public commitment to freedom of speech on his newly acquired platform. And the World Cup has been filled with controversy since the announcement that it would be hosted in Qatar. And that has continued this week with the recent statistic. It is estimated that 400 to 500 migrant workers have died in projects related to the tournament. This figure was announced by the chief of the tournament, Hassan al thwadi who says that, quote, the health and safety standards on the sites are improving. The deaths have been attributed to low-wage, dangerous labor being performed in extreme heat. Human rights organizations have found that migrant workers have faced unpaid wages, forced labor, and an inability to leave their jobs since the World Cup was awarded to Qatar in 2010. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but coming up, flu cases rise in higher numbers than seen in the past decade. And find out how Emerson students are handling seasonal depression as winter approaches. We'll be right back. When I arrive at my destination, I am going to kill Bill. Oh, what? Oh, okay, my cut him, cut him. Oh, sorry, can we get some of this? Where in God's name is the gaffer tape? Hi, I'm Nate. And I'm Casey, and we're the National Broadcasting Society. Come out to some of our weekly workshops, or work on some of our sets. Explore the bigger picture with NBS. We'll see you there. All right, let's get another take. Camera, sound. So yeah, it's like Emerson's very own late night talk show. We've got games like Jimmy Fallon, and we're hot like Jimmy Kimmel, and we've got guests. I'm going to talk to them. You can talk too, I guess. There's a live studio audience, and they're just going to laugh at everything we say, and it's going to be awesome. It's just this never-ending cycle of positivity and community and late night content. I'm going to wear a suit. You should probably wear one too. What do you think? I think you should drink up, because it's closing time. Welcome back to Good Morning Emerson. Starting off with some local news, Governor Charlie Baker held a conference this week to discuss the progress Massachusetts has made in fighting the opioid epidemic. He was joined by Attorney General and recent Governor-elect Mara Healey, along with Boston Families and Health and Human Services Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. While opioid deaths have risen since the start of the pandemic, Massachusetts remains ahead of other states in progress. And in more health news, as the holiday season arrives, so too does flu season. And this winter, the United States is seeing its worst one in more than a decade. 33 states are now experiencing either high or very high levels of respiratory virus, according to the CDC. This doesn't include Massachusetts, where our risk level is still considered as moderate, but the patient numbers are increasing. Experts are especially concerned about the recent Thanksgiving gatherings and what the numbers will look like in the next few days. Doctors say to exercise caution by frequently washing your hands and staying home if you feel sick. We now shift to mental health and to our Emerson Update correspondent, JL Beto, who opened the conversation about seasonal depression among students. JL? The weather is chilly, daylight is diminishing, and winter is right around the corner. Seasonal affective disorder, also known as seasonal depression, has officially begun. I think when it gets super dark, uh, my entire mood just changes completely. Um, it's very hard, so I just like try and like keep in the sun as much as I can. Um, but yeah, like it's very disorienting to have the sunset at 4.30. When fall heads toward winter and daylight begins to decrease, many people experience changes in energy and mood. I'm definitely like a big walker, like I love being outside and most of my classes end like way later so I like to be able to like come out and go walking after so right now I was like debating, I'm like dude it's cold and it's dark, do I really want to go outside right now? So it's definitely like a bit of an internal battle. In most cases, seasonal affective disorder symptoms appear during late fall or early winter and go away during the brighter days of spring and summer. If it's sunny and cold like that's fine but like when it's cloudy or when it gets dark really early I feel like it's a lot harder to like not be happy but like like, I feel like when the sun is out, your problems seem a lot less like problems. You're like, well, at least the sun is shining. But I feel like it's more like the light than the, like the weather. It's not always quite as easy to decrease the effects of seasonal affective disorder. However, there are things you can do to minimize its effects. 
I say this all the time, but come to the Health and Wellness Center, the counseling um, centers downstairs, to uh, 216 Tremont Street, um, second floor for counseling. Um, make sure that you just reach out to people if you need it, friends, family, and then also just know that time will pass. It's only temporary. If you feel able to, definitely reach out to friends. It helps a lot. Or you can reach out to the Resource Center. Takesha Morgan, an Emerson staff member, shared words of encouragement as well as addressing those coming across imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. It is not only a student thing. I think as a BIPOC woman, something I still, in my age, suffer with. So realizing you belong here just like everybody else. For Good Morning Emerson, I'm JL Beto. Thank you so much, JL. It's definitely important to bring awareness to mental health and well being amongst college students. Now, shifting gears to more local politics, the Boston City Council has voted to lower the voting age in municipal elections from 18 to 16 years old. A meeting held today saw the bill pass with a vote of 9 to 4. It will now travel to the Senate House where similar legislation is waiting from both Cambridge and Somerville, a sign that the bill likely won't pass anytime soon. Supporters of the bill cited the classic American value of no taxation without representation. Since 16 and 70 year olds pay taxes, they argue they should have a say in their government. Opposers argue that 16 is just too young to make an informed decision. And the World Health Organization announced that they are creating a new name for monkeypox, and it will instead be called Mpox. The WHO organization's practices for naming infectious diseases typically do not include people's names, animal species, or geographic locations. However, the virus was originally founded and named in 1958 before the policy was created. The Department of Human Health and Services Secretary Xavier Becerra stated that, quote, reducing stigma associated with the disease is one critical step in our work to end monkeypox. The Biden administration announced that they will adopt the name change and shifting to sports. A victory for the United States in the World Cup. Our sports correspondent Claire Overton has the latest. Claire. Thank you, Caroline. The U.S. men's soccer team is moving on to the round of 16 in the World Cup. Christian Pulisic scored what ended up being the game-winning goal in the 38th minute. Just after he scored, Pulisic collided with Iranian goalie and trainers rushed on the field. Pulisic was diagnosed with a pelvic contusion, although he said he will be playing again soon. The U.S. takes on the Netherlands Saturday at 10 a.m. And as they said, we are now in the presence of royalty in Boston. Prince William and Princess Catherine of Wales are in Boston for the Earthshot Prize Awards, but they decided to make a stop at a Celtics game while in the city. Their royal highnesses sat courtside to watch the Celtics play the Heat last night. They are joined by Boston Mayor Michelle Wu, Governor-elect Maura Healey, both owners of the Celtics and their spouses. And boy, did the Celtics put on a show for the visitors from across the pond. Jason Tatum alone put up 49 points in their 134 to 121 win over Miami. And moving on to some news in the NHL, Washington Capitals captain Alex Ovechkin has surpassed Hall of Famer Wayne Gretzky in most career on-the-road goals. Ovechkin scored two goals in the first period of the Capitals' win over the Vancouver Canucks, helping him achieve the record. These goals were number 402 and 403 just for his games played on visiting ice during his 18-year career. This season started less than two months ago, giving Ovechkin lots of room to extend his record. That's all I have for sports. Now back to the desk. Thank you so much, Claire. Now it's finally time for our weekly weather forecast. So, here we go. <laughs> so things are brightening up today as we kick off December. Generally very sunny. Some clouds will come in and out, but wind gusts are coming in strong today from the west around 25 miles per hour or higher. Definitely a day you want to bundle up despite those 40 degrees. Come Friday, you can expect lots of sunshine throughout the day. A lot less wind, your high reaching 48, and later that evening, dropping into the mid-30s. This weekend, we're looking at some showers Saturday morning, and there will be warmer temperatures all day long, floating in those lower 60s. Going to see a roughly a quarter inch of rain, that wind coming right back to us with gusts coming in at 15 miles per hour, maybe even stronger. And Sunday, a mix of sun and clouds, and we're back in the 40s. If you take a look at early next week, Monday is going to be sunny with a little chill in the air, but it's still a perfect day to get out and do some Christmas shopping. Did you do all your Christmas shopping yet? So I definitely have to work on that, but I know for a fact I will not be going out. I will be nope. sitting on my couch, nope. Amazon cart full. Yep. What about you? That's the way to do it. That's mm -hmm. me. I spent Black Friday just laptop on couch, yeah. buying everything. 
Got to steal right those then and there. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but stay tuned to learn more about where to find some incredible sushi right here on campus. And coming up, we have an interview and performance with Emerson's Musical Theatre Society, Cast of Heathers. You won't want to miss it. No, uh, that was your job. Maggie, oh my god, I do it every no, week. No, no, I no, told but, you this but, is the one but we talked I didn't about want this. responsibility. Okay, um, I need to pick my wedgie. Oh my god, look, they got us slushies. Now get used to it. Come on, give me my mic. Mic me. Hi, I'm Christian Mudrick. And I'm Maggie Morlat. And you're watching Real Reactions. On the Emerson Channel. Hi, I'm Aaron Kinningsberg, host of EIV's The Dish. Tune in every Friday for your chance to see what kind of bow tie I pulled out of my closet today. Welcome back. In Hawaii, Mauna Loa, the world's largest active volcano, erupted this past Monday. Although not directly posing a threat, residents were warned to possibly prepare for worse. Hawaii County Civil Defense announced that it has opened shelters for those who may have to evacuate in the future. The lava coming from the eruption could make it close to Hilo and other towns in East Hawaii, but it could take weeks to months. And a lot of you might, can, might have taken an at-home DNA test kit and found something interesting. But what if you were able to find your family you've been separated from for 51 years? For Texas woman Melissa Highsmith, this is exactly what happened. Highsmith was abducted by a babysitter in 1971 when she was just 22 months old. Her family launched a search that lasted four decades but were unable to track her down. On November 6th, the DNA processing company 23andMe was able to connect Melissa and her family, and they reunited this past weekend. The family says they're making up for lost time and getting to truly know one another. Now to find out where is some delicious food around campus, let's go to our Boston Boylston's correspondent, Joshua Fergang. What do you have for us today, Josh? Hi, I'm Josh Fergang, and this is Boylston Bites. We're here at Pick and Roll Sushi, one of the newest additions to Emerson's campus. Let's go check it out. The sushi made its first debut in the Lion's Den last semester, and it was a hit among many Emerson students. The owner and chef of the restaurant, Victor Choi, explains how it grew to be its own standalone shop. Yeah, so as you guys know, I was working with Emerson College for a long time, and uh, we have a great relationship, and I wouldn't have been able to open this restaurant without them, but um, yeah, it was always a passion and a dream of mine, and uh, a dream come true. The restaurant has a variety of options, from classic sushi to chicken teriyaki, and even poke bowls. It not only allows people to expand their palate, but it can fit everyone's needs. I like chicken roll because they have a veggie option, and I don't like sushi. He made sushi accessible for students, allowing them to use board bucks and EC cash. I fell in love with the Emerson College students, and uh, I knew that if I was going to open a restaurant, I wasn't going to steer too far away from you guys. So um, when this one happened to open up, it was kind of the perfect decision to make. <laughs> My favorite thing about pick and roll is probably the environment. Every time I walk in, Victor's always so welcoming. He's always willing to help you out and get your order ready in a timely manner. And he's just a great guy. Chef Victor was nice enough to prepare us a sample of avocado rolls, veggie rolls with eel sauce, mayo, and fried onion, and tuna and salmon sashimi. Let's try some. Mmm. Wow. The rice and the avocado just like complement each other perfectly. It's amazing. Let's try the uh, tuna as well. Mm. You can tell that this is like freshly cut. It's like fresh rice. Like you can tell everything is just fresh and delicious and all prepared by Chef Victor and his staff. I had so much fun talking to Chef Victor today and eating some amazing sushi. 
If you haven't already, go check out Pick and Roll Sushi. They're right here on campus, you can't miss it, and they got some amazing Boylston Bites. Back to you in the studio. You know, Victor actually was the guy who got me into sushi. I did not eat sushi before I, I came to Boston, because no. I don't really eat seafood, but... Okay, yeah, well, I've actually never been to Pick and Roll, so should I really? come with Victor one time? You guys yes. show me what to get? You know, I do gotta say, though, I'm not very adventurous. I stick to my vegetarian rolls. Ooh, okay. But if you like seafood, he's your guy. I'm down. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right, the New England Aquarium is over-treating 150 sea turtles after they got stranded on shore and became hypothermic. The aquarium stated in a release that the cold stunned sea turtles washing up on the Massachusetts beaches has been a reoccurring phenomenon. So far, 150 sea turtles have been treated, with 120 of them being a part of a critically endangered species. The aquarium staff is hoping now that they're feeling better, the little guys will be able to come out of their shells. Now let's move on to some entertainment news. Balenciaga, the luxury fashion brand, plans to sue the production company North Six for its role in creating one of two controversial ads. The backlash began when users online noticed a page from the 2008 Supreme Court decision, United States v. Williams, which upheld the constitutionality of a child pornography conviction in the backdrop for an ad showcasing a $3,000 purse. The ad, which has since been removed from the company's website, was part of the Fashions House Spring 2023 collaboration with the activewear brand Adidas. Balenciaga watchers might not have noticed the Supreme Court decision expert had it not been for a controversy earlier this month with another ad, one from the brand's holiday collection, which featured images of children holding plush bears wearing fishnet tops and leather harnesses, surrounded by flask and chain necklaces. Balenciaga says North Six included the court documents and the campaign without Balenciaga's knowledge or authorization, according to the lawsuit. The company will seek $25 million in damages. And Will Smith revisited his famous Oscar night in his first major TV interview since the slapping of Chris Rock on stage last March. Speaking to Trevor Noah on The Daily Show Monday night, Smith described how he just lost it over Rock's joke about Jada Pinkett Smith's hair. That was the rage that has been bottled up for a really long time, he said. Though he explained that his emotions didn't justify his behavior, Smith was on the show to promote the new film Emancipation, a dark historical drama in which he stars as a runaway slave. Smith said he'd understand if the audience chose to skip seeing the film to boycott his behavior. The actor won the Academy Award for Best Actor for his performance in The King Richard, but the famed smack and its aftermath overshadowed his victory. Smith later resigned from the Academy, which banned him from all of the events for the next 10 years. He eventually apologized to Rock in a video posted to social media in July, but Rock said he wasn't ready to discuss the incident at that time. That's all we have for you today. It was so great waking up with you all. Yes, thank you all so much. Let's now go to Charlotte and Jackson who are with today's musical guests. Thank you so much, Drew. Right now we are joined by Emerson's MTS cast of Heathers. We are here with Hawa Kamara, Asa Dupris, Kate Shambri, and Anna Jean Gianta. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for uh, having us. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so first, what drew you to MTS's production of Heathers? Um, well, I can answer this one if you want. Um, I personally am a BCE major, and I did theater in high school. Um, so the opportunity to do student-run theater here, whereas at a lot of other schools it would be restricted to just theater majors, was really game-changing for me. And, um, you know, I just had followed MTS for a while on social media, and I knew about the work that they had done. So... I've had a wonderful experience. I think anyone into theater, regardless of what major you are, should check it out because you meet a lot of wonderful people. Yeah, that's awesome. So we're doing Heather's, super fun show. So how do you think that Heather's speaks to the current moment? Um, I think that <laughs> Heather has a lot of um, themes and topics that are sort of universal and timeless. There's a lot of talk of if no one knows content warning or trigger warning, there's a lot of talk of suicide and sexual harassment and bullying. And this was set in the 80s, but I think that can sort of speak to, honestly, any time period. So it's cool to like shed a light on those topics. For sure. So Heather's is taking place on December 10th and 11th. Now, what can we expect as the audience? Will there be anything new and different in this musical? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that a little bit, <laughs> if you guys like, want to sprinkle in. Um, but it's definitely, we're definitely taking it in a more realistic approach, and we're approaching it 
the movie is a little campier, and most productions of the musical are a little bit campier, but we are like kind of going at it at a more like raw, real look, as opposed to that um, that over the top uh, kind of view of it. Uh, and also like making some interesting casting choices, like. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, we're doing some some cool things to change it up. Awesome. Awesome. I Super excited. It. Well, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Tickets for the show come out on Friday, December second at noon. And stay tuned for their performance coming up right here on Good Morning Emerson. You don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. Hey. We're your, uh, your, your, your roomies, your homies, your new living yeah, best. We, we live here too. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Action. Do you have any idea what time it is? It's time. Four, seven. Oh. Seven? It would mean a lot to me if you guys watch. Do you only care about yourself? I'm getting kind of worried about Charlie. The audacity! Promise me you're not going to do anything weird tonight. No. no. I am a koala. Welcome back. We now have the MTS cast of Heather's Performing Candy Store. Take it away, guys. Martha's had a crush on Ram for like 12 years now. This will kill her. Come on, Heather. <laughs> You're bigger than this. Are we going to have a problem? You got a bone to pick? You've come so far. Why now are you pulling on my dick? I normally slap your face off, and everyone here could watch, but I'm feeling nice. Here's some advice. Listen up. I like Looking hot, buying stuff they cannot. I like Drinking hard, Max and Dad. Your mommy fix you a snack Whoa! Or you could come smoke Pound some rum and coke In my Porsche with the car Tickets go on sale this Friday, December 2nd at noon. You can find more information on their Instagram at mts.emerson. Thank you for waking up with us, and we will see you next time right here on Good Morning Emerson. Woo!